Hello and welcome to this Ecumenical Ash Wednesday service. This service is put together by several congregations here in Crawfordsville, Christ Lutheran, First Christian, St. John's, and Wabash Avenue Presbyterian. We're grateful that you're with us for this service in a time of pandemic when our gathering as we are used to doing is not yet possible again. We call you now to worship on this Ash Wednesday. God sent Christ into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God's love endures forever. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. God's love endures forever. Let us confess our sins together in the presence of God and in the words of Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner since I left my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again. Sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, 
I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. And so we confess in a moment of silence. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. We hear the word today from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Eternal God, without your light, we are blind. Without your word, we are lost. Without your life, we are dead. Grant us your spirit so that we may receive your truth. Amen. A reading from Isaiah 51. Shout a full-throated shout. Hold nothing back. A trumpet blast shout. Tell my people what's wrong with their lives. Face my family Jacob with their sins. They are busy, busy, busy at worship and love studying all about me. To all appearances, they're a nation of right living people, law abiding, God honoring, they ask me what's the right thing to do and love having me on their side. But they also complain, why do we fast and you don't look our way? Why do we humble ourselves and you don't even notice? Well, here's why. The bottom line on your fast days is profit. You drive your employees much too hard. You fast, but at the same time you bicker and fight. You fast, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you do won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fasting I'm after? A day to show off humility? To put on a pious long face and parade around solemnly in black? Do you call that fasting? A fast day that I, God, would like? This is the kind of fast day I'm after. To break the chains of injustice. Get rid of exploitation in the workplace. Free the oppressed. Cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help and I'll say, here I am. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you're generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Matthew 6. Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. 
It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. So when you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them, treating prayer meetings and street corners alike as a stage. Acting compassion as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly and unobtrusively. This is the way your God who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. And when you come before God, don't turn into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. When you practice some appetite denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production of it. It might turn you into a small time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training inwardly, act normal outwardly. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face. God doesn't require attention getting devices. He won't overlook what you are doing. He'll reward you well. Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and you will end up being. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I grew up in a rural Hoosier country church and Ash Wednesday was definitely something we did not do. For one thing, it was a little too Catholic for us. And for another thing, why would we? If you would kind of go back, and if I would go back all those decades ago, I think that our notion of sin, or my notion of sin, certainly back then, was summed up something like uh, in the old adage, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with girls who do. Uh, sin, if it was mentioned, which wasn't very often, was mostly something personal, and it was mostly something pretty trivial. You know, Ash Wednesday is here to remind us that sin is not trivial, and it's not just personal. I'd heard vaguely, occasionally, on the news, didn't pay much attention to it, about the Uyghurs, this is a small ethnic minority group in China that happens to be Muslim. And China has efficiently moved them all into re-education camps. Well, education isn't all that's going on on those camps, in, uh, in those camps. There is a human rights group in Australia that received some footage that was smuggled out of those camps that uh, in addition to re-education, that China is putting the Uyghurs to forced manual labor in creating some very nice Tony goods for 82 international brands, including Abercrombie and & Fitch and BMW and many upper-end products. And so I looked at that and found that, yeah, I have a few things from these 82 different international corporations, which means that I have some things that have come from essentially slave labor. The phone that's recording this video is made up of conflict minerals that come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
I have friends in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and there have been in the last three decades over six million people die there while no one cared. And the slaughter has been over um, armed groups fighting for these mines where things like coltan go into microchips that go into our phones and practically everything else we own, which makes me a responsible party, a consuming party for some of the crud that that conflict has generated and for many of the lives and much of the blood that has been spilled. Sin is definitely not trivial. And sin is not just some personal little private thing I do. It's something that taints my relationships and extends out into the world. And it all has mutually reinforcing effects that leave us caught in a web that we cannot break. We heard from Isaiah and Matthew how sin, how wickedness, injustice, evil destroys our lives and dehumanizes us. And we also heard from Isaiah and Matthew what the solution is. Thanks be to God, the good news on this Ash Wednesday and every day is that by grace there is another way. God has given us the good gift of the law. And Jesus, our Savior, has given us the perfect way to keep that law. Love your neighbor with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Only in Hebrew, there is no word for yourself. It's more accurately translated, love your neighbor like your own kin like they're your flesh and blood. And as we do that, so often our lives that are reflected by sirens and terrible things that are happening, and our world that is mired in events that seem to demean and tarnish the possibilities for humanity and creation that God imagined, as we step away from and out of things that we shouldn't be doing, and as we engage in those things in which God wants us to be about, then we become free. Our lives, by grace, are filled with compassion, forgiveness, generosity, humility, reverence, and peace. And folks, our old world could use a whole lot more of that. So, on this Ash Wednesday, the first of 40 days leading up to Easter, let me ask, what do you need to do? What do you need to do to make your relationships more loving? What do you need to make your life more pure? What do we need to make our world, via the small but essential part you play in it, more just and equitable and loving and grace-filled? Now is the time, the grace-filled time, for us to turn from our old enslaving ways and for us to live into the new way and the glad truth and the abundant life that Jesus Christ offers us all. This morning, I'm recording this on Tuesday, and we've got a huge winter storm brewing. Snow is coming down. It's 14 degrees and what did I see in a bush just outside the church door when I came? I saw a robin. Now, robins return in the spring. They migrate, Hoosier robins do. They are at least smart enough to be a snowbird. They head down where it's warm, and they come back when the conditions are right. Well, what on earth is this stupid robin doing here in the middle of this winter storm that we're engulfed in right now. Well, you see, robins just don't show up in March and April when it's sunny and the grass is green. No, they arrive now so they can prepare their nests and find their mating partner 
and so that when the conditions are the best for the world to turn to spring and to turn green again, they are already in place. God in Christ invites us as the church, as the body of Christ, to be the avant-garde of the new creation. While the rest of the world is snowbound and slumbering, we are to be the ones who are on the move, like robins. We're the ones to be creating our territory and to be investing in the things that will not only be in place when God's kingdom comes in full and everything is green and lush and right and true, but we are to labor for those things now, invest in those things now, live for those things now in order that God's Easter kingdom may dawn that much sooner and that lives may be touched and filled and blessed because we cared enough, because we said enough of the crud. We want to live for what Christ offers us. We want to be about God's vision for the world. So during this Lent, I encourage you, encourage you to let go of some things that you know you need to get rid of and to embrace some ways, some new ways of living that will draw you closer to Christ and that will make you an even more integral and essential and effective part of God's Easter kingdom. May it be so for us all. May you join me for a moment of silence as I lead us in the prayer of penitence. Let us pray.
God of mercy, hear our prayers. As we join together in Christian unity, each representing a body of the universal Christ, we admit, Holy One, that we have not always been your faithful servants. We bear our faults and our mistakes upon us, and we remember that our time on this earth is limited and that one day we shall return back into the earth. We ask God that with all the time we have that you be our eternal guide. Open our eyes toward any injustice that inflicts our neighbors. Open our hands to be your servants in the world and not turn anyone away from our care. Open our hearts to love and reject any form of hate and apathy that seeks to damage our relationship with your children and you, God. Holy One, you are our strength. And upon your foundation, we will, be, we will overcome the mistakes and the sins that haunt our spirits. In your mercy, God, may we receive your forgiveness that will help us transform us more and more to be true followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. May he be our example of how to live and serve, and may we be open to the change you set upon our hearts that will help us become better images of your glorious presence here upon your creation. In your precious name we pray. Amen. In the footsteps of centuries of pilgrims, go now to embark on your Lenten journey. Consider how you may simplify your days so that you might travel lightly. Be alert to all the things that could sidetrack you. 
notice that which beckons you alluringly or with apparently greater urgency than the pilgrim journey that Christ invites. Do not try to cover more than one good day's journey at a time. Know when to stop to eat and to sleep so that the journey will not be too great for you. Walk humbly, knowing that the goal is not recognition or achievement or reward, but rather simply to have come to know Christ and yourself more intimately. Be on the lookout for other pilgrims caring for those who limp or fall, those who cannot see the way forward. For pilgrimage is so much richer in community. Go now, place your hand into the outstretched hand of Christ, allow the words of his story to guide you, and pray for tranquility of heart and mind as you go from this point on and rest in the grace of God, be guided by the peace of Christ, and may you celebrate in this journey your belonging through the unity of the Spirit. Amen.